Kelly. Thank you everybody for being here. I have just a little bit of time to get going, but we managed. Now, I may sniffle. Can't hear you. I may sniffle. <laughs> because, you know, apparently this Ohio spring weather has a lot of allergies. And I have a lot of allergies. And even though I've been taking allergy desensitization shots for four years, it doesn't seem to be doing a darn thing. So, I just wanted to let you know one thing. If I sniffle, it's all your fault. <laughs> all right, so that was an incredible talk yes. by Jason, wasn't it? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Some applause. Uh, you know, I at first thought I may have been, I, I still think I might have overdone it. I put a lot of information on <coughs> This in this uh, presentation just for you folks here in Ohio. But after hearing Jason speak, he teed up what I'm about to say really, really well. Because he talked about, you know, the history going back to the intellectual development of our society, our current society, from Rome and Greece and the development of our country. What I'm going to go into, to a certain extent, at least to give you some background, is the history of how we got to this upside down, inverted culture that we have that's allowed things to go so totally off the rails. And I have to first say, you know, <clears throat> well, I'll make a crass commercial message first. This is my book, The Red-Green Axis, Refugees, Immigration, and the Agenda to Erase America. I also have the Agenda 2, Masters of Deceit, in which I am featured for all of about two seconds. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> Curtis Bowers lot, left a lot of me on the cutting room floor, because I know our uh, interview was about two hours worth. But be that as it may, it's a really, really good documentary. I think it's even better than his first one, in which I was prominently feature. I'll get over it. But um, so uh, <clears throat> have a look at those things. I have to be completely honest. You can also buy my book, darn it, or not buy it, get it free of charge at the Center for Security Policy website by just downloading the PDF. So I'm pretty much undermining my whole one minute spiel. I better shut up. Um, <laughs> Here we go. First principles. Oh, let, let me, before I start with that, wait, wait. The refugee resettlement agenda, or at least as it's considered these days, is not a partisan agenda. There are Democrats that believe in refugee resettlement. There are Republicans that believe in refugee resettlement. There are liberals that believe in refugee resettlement. There are conservatives who believe it. And then, of course, there's everybody else on the other side. What I hope to convince you tonight, however, is that the people who are in favor of that agenda have, either, have been either horribly misled or they are working an alternate agenda that we aren't aware of that's designed to increase their power, their wealth, and at the same time undermine our society, undermine our rule of law, undermine our constitutional form of government. Okay. The issue is never the issue. A leftist said that in the 60s. And, hold on, he was being more honest than they usually are. 
Pick an issue. It doesn't matter if it's refugee resettlement. It doesn't matter if it's gay rights. It doesn't matter if it's uh, illegal immigration amnesty. It doesn't matter if it's environment. Pick an issue, any issue. What he was saying was that it doesn't matter. The issue only has value insofar as it can be used as a vehicle to advance their agenda. And their agenda, when you scrape away all the pretty phrases and all the propaganda, is power and wealth. That's it. Nothing more, nothing more. And there's nothing new about it. We've been fighting that battle since the dawn of time. Right? They seize the more... Now, the, this is the one thing that happens, though, with these agendas. They seize the moral high ground and wrap themselves in the mantle of compassion. Making any... It's, it's an offensive maneuver. You have to understand this. These are all tactics. This isn't reality. Although, many of the people on the ground that work in these agendas really believe in them. But the overall agenda... That it's tactical. It's tactical that they choose those things because how can you fight against that? When somebody has wrapped themselves in the mantle of compassion and well intentions and good intentions, it's very difficult to knock that down, knock that out of the way. Especially if that organization, that group, that individual has the megaphone. And in this country, they clearly do. The issue only matters as a vehicle to advance the left's, and this that's why it is, a left-wing agenda, power and wealth. It's a crisis strategy. It dilutes American culture. We are bringing in people from all over the world who do not understand, do not do not understand our Constitution, do not understand our culture, do not understand our rule of law. And some of them are able to assimilate, but many of them are not. And I can put numbers to that, which I will later. But one thing it does do is it cultivates a whole new base of reliable voters for left-wing politicians. Now, this is where the history gets interesting. And this is where I may have overdone it. <laughs> Who's ever heard of Sergei Nechayev? Hands? Not a single person. Sergei Nechayev, he was 23, or 22, sorry, when he wrote the Revolutionary Catechism. He had a couple of years in college. He did a year uh, auditing classes and he was teaching in a local school and he preached put it onto himself to preach the destruction of the world as we know it he was responsible for planning and executing the assassination of Tsar Alexander II and he inspired Lenin's older brother to attempt the same thing with Tsar Alexander III <laughs> Lenin's older brother was caught, executed, and probably contributed a lot to Lenin's radicalization. Now this is why Sergei is important. Oh, by the way, he uh, was in a group of people who were called the Nihilists. It was the first time that that phrase was really applied to a group. And he popularized the phrase, um, the ends justify the means. It was actually a Jesuit phrase, but he took it to himself and popularized it, and uh, the left uses it. This is the one thing I want you to see that he said. Now, the Society of Revolutionary Conspirators has no aim other than the complete liberation and happiness of the masses. So we wanted what was best for everybody. He wanted our complete and total liberation. However, convinced that their emancipation and achievement of this happiness can only come about as the result of an all-destroying popular revolt, the society of revolutionaries will use all its resources and energy 
toward increasing and intensifying the evils and miseries of the people until at last their patience is exhausted and they are driven to a general uprising. Does that feel like kind of what we're in now? See, nobody knows who he was, but he was an icon of the left. He was a megalomaniacal sociopath, um, but his revolutionary catechism formed the blueprint for Lenin's uh, first government and how he would treat the people, right down to the order of execution. If you go read his revolutionary catechism, he outlines who should die in what order and who can be allowed to live as long as they serve the cause of the revolution until they've outlived their usefulness. Lenin was able to execute about 100,000 100, people before he died early, but Stalin picked up and took care of things. So, I call it the red-green axis because right now we are dealing with radical leftists and we are also dealing with radical Islamists and they have joined forces. And if you don't believe me, this woman is working for the Department of Justice and she calls for revolution. She was designated by the Muslim American Society to assist refugees with the Department of Homeland Security, Justice, and the Executive Office for Immigration Review. And she has said, she said after um, San Bernardino that Muslims were going to be murdered in the street because we were going to be such bad people because we're so terrible and, and Islamophobic that we're going to go out there and kill the Muslims. I just don't see it happening, folks. Read what she says. We are the community that staged a revolution across the world. She's talking about the Arab Spring. If we could do that, why can't we have that revolution in America? So think about that. She works for the Department of Justice in the Office of Immigration Review. But it's not new. The refugee resettlement agenda was actually set by the UN at the 1976 Conference on Human Settlements. Now this was an amazing conference because it set the stage for a lot of what we see going on now today. But it really didn't talk about resettlement. Human settlement policies can be powerful tools for the more equitable distribution of income and opportunities. What they wanted to do was redistribute populations around the world. The UN is a socialist organization. It's been run by socialists since the beginning. Most people don't know that Alger Hiss, anybody know who Alger Hiss was? Okay. Alger Hiss wrote the UN Charter. Alger Hiss was a Soviet agent. So since its inception, the United Nations has been a foreign policy tool of the Soviet Union. That's why it always seems to turn and go against us. Because they are against us. But the th interesting thing, and they also said some very scary things. Private land, land ownership is a uh, contributes to social injustice and public control of the land use is therefore indispensable <coughs> so they want to abolish private property now if you know anything about you know anything about the recent HUD rulings where they're putting people they're putting low-income housing that is basically <coughs> a, a, a taking that is a property taking and HUD has created these incredible rules and people, uh, counties and cities are lured into taking these HUD grants and they don't read the fine print. The, fi the fine print turns the uh, planning and zoning over to HUD 
It turns everything over to HUD. If you accept the monies, you have to do exactly what they say, and if you don't do it aggressively, they sue you. So, if you have any influence on any city council, convince them, don't accept HUD grants, because you uh, give up all of your power, and they will take it. But the interesting thing was, all of this redistribution was always targeted towards the West. Why didn't China or Russia or Eastern Europe have to deal with, you know, this redistribution of population and resources and land and everything? Why was it always targeted at the West? Well, because the West is the target. It's, it's not the real agenda. The real agenda is to overthrow the West. And this is just another pretext. The Refugee Act of 1980 was written by Teddy Kennedy. He also wrote the Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965. Both were changed, both fundamentally changed uh, our immigration system, our refugee acceptance system, to allow in refugees and immigrants from the world over. Prior to 1980, the refugee system was primarily used to help people escape communism. Afterwards, that changed entirely, and people began coming here from all over the world. The 1965 Immigration Act uh, opened the floodgates to third world populations from all over the world, and we now see the result. So, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees selects about 95% of the refugees that are selected to come to the United States. And they send their referrals to the State Department, the State Department picks out the ones they want, they turn it over to these private resettlement contractors, which are called voluntary agencies, although they're not voluntary at all, they get paid a whole lot of money. We nickname them Volags. And they decide every week where to place refugees. They're supposed to consult with stakeholders. Keep that word in your mind. Who's a stakeholder in this room? Who's a stakeholder in your community? Let me, let me put it this way. Raise your hand if you're not a stakeholder in your community. Well, how many times have the Volags come to you to ask for your permission? Never. They have a special definition of stakeholders. Stakeholders are people with uh, money in the game. Stakeholders are people with something to lose or something to gain. Rather, we'll get into that. They rarely consult with the communities and when they do it's because it's friendly communities that want the people there that they already know about. Don't let anybody, now this is where the misinformation comes again. We are racists, we're xenophobes, we're nativists. I love that one, we're nativists. <laughs> what on earth is the matter with being a nativist? I love my country. Um, we're Islamophobes because we won't resettle all the people they want. Well, we already resettle more refugees than all other resettlement nations combined. About 70% of the world's refugees come here. In my mind, that's too much. Call me a nativist, I could care less. <laughs> now here's the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, the current one, just appointed in January, sitting with Ann Richards. She's the Assistant Secretary of State for Population, Refugees, and Migration. And they're signing a, a new agreement. We pay the UN High Commissioner more than any other country to resettle refugees. And we've been working under a memorandum of understanding with them. The UN selects our refugees. Keep that in your mind. And the UN is heavily influenced by Organization for Islamic Cooperation, which is comprised of 56 
Islamic countries, and the Palestinian territories. It's the second largest organization in the world next to the UN that nobody knows about. And it has very strong influence in the UN. And that's one of the many reasons why we're getting over 100,000 Muslims from uh, people from Muslim countries every year now. Regardless of the security risks. Now this was guy was the uh, High Commissioner until December. And I went to see him talk. And I was 10 feet away from this guy when he said that security concerns were stupid. Anybody who's worried about ISIS or anybody sneaking in on the refugee flow, either to Europe or the United States, is stupid. And he repeated it. Everybody in the room laughed. This was Georgetown University figures. Um, Georgetown University School of Law. It's very sad. But um, the FBI Director Comey had just said, we cannot vet refugees from Syria. The Director of National Intelligence had said that it was a grave concern, it was a huge concern, that ISIS would try to slip in among the refugee flow. <clears throat> But they're stupid. Now, he was the former Prime Minister of Portugal. The same time he was telling this, just before France, by the way, same time he was telling this, Portugal was putting out its resettlement goal for Syrians. How many? 23. <laughs> Those Portuguese must be real idiots, I swear. Only 23. But this is incredible. You know, this guy, wined and dined, heralded as the second coming, you know, he disgraces the office with statements like that. Even if it was correct. He cited the uh, fact that some of the people coming from Syria and North Africa and other places going into Europe are paying $5,000 and more, taking a circuitous route all the way through Russia and back down to Poland, into Germany, why on earth would ISIS do something like that when they can just sneak in? Well, what he didn't say, and perhaps he's too stupid to know it, but he shouldn't be, ISIS runs a lot of those networks. So why wouldn't they slip people in? Especially considering the fact that ISIS has its own uh, passport manufacturing facility. Two of the um, attackers in France were had Syrian refugee, uh, had Syrian passports. And the really scary thing is that we have a visa waiver program that it's an agreement with 38 countries that if somebody from that country shows up at our border with a passport from that country, they don't need a visa to get in. They just come right in. So I think that uh, passport manufacturing facility is going to come in very handy for ISIS. It's going to give us a lot of troubles. And I'll talk more about the visa waiver program later. So are ISIS worries really stupid? We have almost 1,000 FBI investigations in all 50 states. We have uh, 28 convictions, 80 arrests already. This guy, Mohammed Hassan, is believed to be the recruiter of the San Bernardino killers. He was a Somali refugee living in Minnesota, and he decided to join the Jihad and go back to Somalia, where he got on the internet and started recruiting people. There's so much more. I, I, I could come up with pages of this stuff, but I see people yawning already, so I'll have to stop. <laughs> I put this together. This is a timeline of terror plots that the FBI defines as the terror plot, which I have to tell you is a small subset of what the real terror plots were, because they're very careful. They don't want to describe anything as Islamic terror if they don't have to. The last one, 212, that was that Columbus restaurant 
where that guy went in there and tried to kill people with a machete. Yep. So, fortunately, they killed him. You can see the uh, events accelerating. Here we go. Three ISIS suspects have been arrested in Ohio. But there's so much misinformation about this entire program. You know, we, our heartstrings are pulled with these awful sights of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of refugees streaming into Europe. And the little boy lying on the, on the beach after having drowned in the Mediterranean. I mean, it, it, it really is. It, it, it you know, it, it's very, um, it's very sad to see this, but it's also very a lot of misinformation. That little boy who, who was drowned in Mediterranean, his father was a Syrian, but he had since moved to Turkey. He had lived in Turkey for two years. He was working, his wife was working, they had an apartment. They just decided to jump on the train and go north to see if they could get a better life in, in Western Europe. So that's what they did, and unfortunately, they got on an overcrowded boat, and his son's death was a result. They were not refugees. Eighty percent of the people going into Western Europe are not refugees. They're not even from Syria. I don't even know what they are. They say they're economic migrants. Most of them are men of military age. And, uh, the way they've been behaving to me is not indicative of somebody that's going somewhere to get a job. There are four million, the people that we are gonna resettle. There was a, 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 an article in a paper this morning that we, we referenced. I was talking with Dave earlier. And it said, Syrians fleeing war being resettled in the United States. No, they're not. No, they're not. The Syrians fleeing the war, to the extent any are fleeing the war, going into Europe, are not coming here. The people who are coming here are people in refugee camps in Jordan, Turkey, and Lebanon, who have been there for years because it takes a minimum of 18 months to go through the application process. It's a long, involved process. And they've all been there, they've all been getting fed, they're housed, and here's the biggest thing. The refugee program, the top priority is return people home. It is not to resettle them. That is complete misinformation. The primary goal of refugee resettlement is to send refugees back to their homes. Guess why? Because that's where most of them want to go. That's where most of them grew up. That's where they have relatives, that's how they have a common language, common culture. They know it. And you know, when Ben Carson went through the refugee camps, that's what he found. They all said, we just want to go home. And I, I could tell you a story about that, but we don't have time. Resettlement is the last resort. We can help 12 people in place for what it costs to resettle one refugee to the United States. Twelve people. Which is more compassionate? <coughs> helping twelve or helping one? Does anybody <laughs> have an idea? <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. <laughs> They're not refugees. Most of the Syrians in the refugee camps are individuals who have crossed an international border fleeing generalized violence. They are not considered refugees under our law, which is based on the 19, well you can't see it, but it's the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees. People who are Refugees are people who have a fear of persecution based on race, religion, nationality, blah, 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 blah. Who are they? Who is ISIS beheading? Christians. What? Christians. Oh my God. And how many Christians did we resettle last year? 
30. 30 Syrian Christians. And you know why? Because the Syrian Christians won't go to the refugee camps. You know why? Because they're afraid to. They get treated just as badly in the refugee camps by the Muslims there as they're getting treated by ISIS back in Syria. So they are really between a rock and a hard place, aren't they? Now, here's another bit of misinformation. We resettled 2,071 Syrians in 2015. Okay, 30 Christians, 13 were others. So there's some of the other folks that are also being persecuted would fall into the category of genuine refugees. Most of the Muslims are not. In fact, most of the Muslims that are in the refugee camps are in the group of Sunni Muslims that actually started the uh, civil war in the first place. Unfortunately, they did it with our help. It's a national disgrace. But here's the big bit of misinformation. <clears throat> Everybody's screaming about bringing in 100,000 Syrian refugees. Well, guess what? Since 2012, 102,000 have already come to the United States. They just didn't come in through the refugee program. There are myriad other programs they can come in under. And nobody's talking about them. Why is that? Well, the resettlement contractors get paid by the head to resettle refugees. And guess who's screaming? for us to bring in 100,000, actually 200,000 Syrians. One single guess. It's those refugee contractors, the Volags. Why? Because they didn't get their share on that share on that first 100,000. There's other programs. There's the asylum program. There's temporary protected status with 5,000 approved and 5,000 more eligible, that's Syrians. There's parole. Obama has just gone nuts with the parole program. And then there's the visa waiver program, and there's actually dozens of other ones that take forever to go through them all. So here's a look at what the numbers really look like, okay? So we got refugees, SIV, that's special immigrant visas, that's from people from Iraq and Afghanistan who helped us in the war. Now those are genuine refugees. Those are people who helped us, those are people with a genuine fear of persecution in their home country because they helped us. Now, I'm perfectly happy to let them come here and resettle here. They're the kind of people we want. Although even some of them have become kind of testy lately. Cuban Haitian program. That's gone up to 61,000 in 2015. <coughs> Who knew? Hmm. Asylum seekers. And then we have the families of the asylum seekers, which is about another 15,000 a year. That's not on here. Trafficking victims. And the unaccompanied alien children program, which actually that 2014 of 57,000 is half of what it is because the unaccompanied alien children, A, were not children, and B, were not unaccompanied. They came with families. It was over 130,000 altogether, including the families. But the UACs get the benefit of the resettlement program. The parents and folks don't, at least not legally. They probably get them anyway. So, we're talking 195,000 people in 2015 alone. Over a million people since Obama took office. It's a lot of folks. We allow one million legal permanent residents in this country per year now. So, this is just, a, actually this is just a drop in the bucket. When you consider all the various programs, a million a year. None of that is sustainable. We admit more than two, twice the number of Muslim immigrants than the European Union does. We've allowed in 680,000 people from Muslim majority nations since uh, 2009. Oh, here's the visa waiver program. 
We allow in 20 million people a year under the visa waiver program. 20 million. Now how many of those could be ISIS people with a fake Western European passport? Anybody want to guess? I don't. We had 153,000 overstays in 2015. 29% of all short-term visa overstays. Out of control, folks. Totally. And, you know, the refugee resettlement program, ISIS has said they will bring in people through the refugee resettlement program. I believe they already have. But to be honest with you, programs like the visa waiver program, the asylum program, temporary protected status, have a much lower bar. Peace of people can basically walk across the border and get in legally under those programs. In temporary protected status, they designate the country, and Syria got that designation in 2012. Anybody coming across the southern border that says, I'm a Syrian, oh, well, you're here under temporary protected status. You're a legal citizen for 18 months. And after 18 months, you can uh, reapply. Now, of course, they may find something while they're checking you out coming across the border, but it's not, they don't go to any great lengths to figure out who you are. And the asylum program is hilarious. We've got affirmative asylees and defensive asylees. Affirmative asylees are people who show up at the border, at border places, and say, I'm an asylum seeker, I want, I want asylum in the U.S., and they fill out a form. They're allowed in while the form is being processed. 83% are approved. And then we have defensive asylees. These are people who try to sneak in across the border. And they get caught. And then they say, oh, I'm an asylum seeker. And they get a form. And they fill it out. It's about 50-50 between defensive and affirmative asylum seekers. 83% approval rate. Okay, so here we are at the costs. Department of Homeland Security does intake interviews, 32 million. That's a plug number for 2017 because I don't have a number, but I just did a straight line extrapolation. It's reasonable. It's probably bigger than that because there's a lot more people this year. State Department, 418 million, 567 million. That's all the placement exams and things like that. The Health and Human Services Office of Refugee Resettlement has gone from 1.5 billion, or 1.6 billion really, to 2.2 billion in fiscal year 2017. That's a, a budget request for 2017. Total almost $3 billion. And it's going up because the next year they're going to resettle another 30,000 Syrians. This year they're resettling 10,000 despite the fact that we already have 100,000. So here are the Volags. Most of them are quote-unquote religious. I say to you, I submit to you that they are not religious at, at all. They are federal government contractors earning big money for the federal government. They are not allowed to proselytize anybody from your church or anybody who's in favor of this tells you that this is a perfect opportunity for Christians to get Muslim converts, hmm. they're breaking the law if they do that. They're not allowed to do that. They are allowed to resettle refugees under very specific guidelines, and it's very favorable to the refugees, very unfavorable to us. But this is 2014, I have not figured 2015 yet, haven't gotten through all the data. And then we have the two largest unaccompanied alien children resettlement uh, organizations, the Baptist Child and Family Services, which by itself got 291.7 million to resettle uh, those unaccompanied minors from uh, Central America in 2014. But they're not the only ones. Uh, Catholic Charities, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, got tons of them. Uh, Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service. I can't remember. I got. I think it was 18 million they got. I forget. Um, but all of them are involved in both, to one degree or another. It's big money, folks. That's what it's about. It's big money. 
I've figured it at approximately 5,000 a head. For some, it's a few, a little bit smaller. For some, it's significantly higher. Yes, ma'am. Uh, these are federal dollars, right? Federal government So dollars. where's the cry out about separation of church and state here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, the, well, that's just it. The churches can't be churches. Is that one year? Where's the separation between church and state? See, but they're not really churches. They're voluntary agencies. They're government contractors. But, you know, it's a good point. It's worth mentioning. It doesn't seem to matter when they're doing the bidding of the government or when they're doing the bidding of the left. It's, it's just fine with them. Uh, there's no separation at all. It's just when we start demanding our constitutional rights that it becomes problematic. Okay, so I, I'm just going to skip over this. This is uh, the one that I referenced earlier where um, a guy named David Robinson, before he became the Secretary for the Population, Refugees, and Migration, did a study of the resettlement of 20,000 Kosovar Albanians in the year 2000. None of them wanted to come. The UN High Commissioner didn't want them to come. The State Department didn't want them to come. They didn't want to come. The Macedonian government was happy to have them where they were. They all wanted to go home. However, the Committee on Migration and Refugee Affairs, which is now called the Refugee Council of the USA, got in touch with Bill Clinton. I guess it must have been before he had his library, but uh, there's some money changed hands, I'm certain. Something changed hands, anyway. Um, and over everybody's objections, those 20,000 Kosovar Albanians were resettled to the United States. Hmm. Because the refugee contractors wanted it, period. No other reason. Okay, so this comes right out of the Refugee Council's listing. And it's also listed on the uh, websites of many of the voluntary agencies. While Americans suffer and pay, Volags promise refugees decent, safe, sanitary, affordable housing and good repair, essential furnishings, food, food allowance, seasonal clothing, pocket money, blah, 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 assistance applying for public benefits, assistance with health screening, assistance with registering children in school, transportation to job interviews, and job training. All for them. I wouldn't mind some of that stuff. I sure don't, don't get it. But I pay for it, and so do you. Here are the Volags in Ohio. We have Catholic Charities, Catholic Social Services, which probably works for Catholic Charities or the U.S. Conference, uh, Community Refugee and Immigration Services, <coughs> International Services Center, International Institute, Migration and Refugee Services, U.S. Together, and World Relief. There's only two actual of the nine VOLAGs listed here, World Relief, Catholic Charities. The rest are subcontractors of one of those nine. And the International Institute, for example, I believe, is a subcontractor for the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants, or it's the International Rescue Committee. I'm not sure which. Easy enough to find out. But these are the groups that are resettling refugees in Ohio. Here are the top 20 resettlement countries between 2003 and 2016. Got a lot of Bhutanese, tons of Somalis, a bunch from Iraq, Burma, Democratic Republic of the Congo, and then a smattering of people from other places. 121 Syrians, 143 Afghans, Twenty-five thousand nine hundred and forty-six in total, and these are the top ten resettlement cities. Columbus, eleven thousand six hundred ninety-nine. Most of those are, excuse me, most of those are Somalis. Akron, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Dayton, and the rest are small numbers. Yeah, well, ninety-three percent of the total in those ten cities. Now here's some special grant examples. You know that, that list I gave you before of all the things that they provide? They also provide these grants for 
refugees to get into business, like they have one called Refugee Agriculture, where if you want to start a community garden, you can get a uh, grant for that. Uh, let's see, ethnic community self, oh, home-based child care business. If you're living at home and you have your kids and your neighbor's kids and they all speak Somali or something, what better arrangement than to ask for a grant and just become a home-based child care service? We can't do that. It's not without jumping through a whole bunch of legal hoops. My favorite account, that one though, is individual development accounts. And in the next slide, the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants for North Carolina advertises the individual development accounts on their web page. So the refugee goes to USCRI, develops a savings plan with the staff, and then they receive dollar for dollar match up to $2,000 per person or $4,000 per family for every dollar you put in a savings account to teach you responsible savings. Well, you know what? I'm not a very responsible saver. I really like to get four two thousand. Well, I have a family. Heck, with it, four thousand bucks. But I don't. Now it says, look, it says we believe that the accumulation of assets is integral to reducing poverty and building the financial empowerment of families in New Zealand. Yeah, well, it's nice, but if somebody just gives you the money, does that actually teach you anything? Does that teach you responsibility? Of course it, it doesn't. It teaches you entitlement. That's what it teaches you. And that's what these people become. Here is percentage of refugees on welfare. Muslims are off the chart, but all refugees are off the chart compared to the U.S. rates. Cash assistance, Medicaid, RMA is refugee medical assistance. They, refugees get special Medicare. Food stamps, look at that, 89.4% for Muslim refugees. That goes down a little bit over time, but it still stays way above the national average for Americans. And this is just the back of the envelope thing I did. About two million a year based on that chart that I had for 197,000 refugees and others for the one year, two billion dollars. Uh, but remember that we're accumulating people over over the years, over the years. It's, it's more work that I can do to figure out what the total is, but it's huge. And here's my favorite. Refugees take jobs Americans won't. Where have you heard that? Huh? Where have you heard that? Okay, now this is why so many Republicans, even conservative Republicans, fall into this trap. People, uh, now this is an interesting study by the Cato Institute. In Ohio, the welfare to work trade off is $13.81 an hour, equivalent to about $29,000 a year. In other words, you can get, collect that much welfare and not work. So why work? Right? Okay? Now, so the companies say, oh, well, we got to pay thirteen eighty one, and now we got to pay fourteen dollars an hour to get some some American to get off his damn couch and come to work. When we can get an enthusiastic refugee to come to work for seven twenty five an hour. Actually, the average way for refugees in twenty fourteen was nine dollars and fifty nine cents. Okay, I'm just quibbling here, but just for the sake of argument, at the minimum wage. Okay. Oh, but guess what? For a family of four, so we figure, okay, we got the refugee, either husband or wife, and the other person sitting around, and they've got two kids. They're getting $15,000 a year. Well, guess what? If they're getting $15,000 a year, they can receive another $17,000 in welfare benefits. So we're paying the same price. We're paying the same uh, hourly rate for the refugee but it's just not the manufacturer that's paying it. It's shifted over to guess who? <laughs> Fellow suckers. All of us. That's the game. That's the game. 
And it's really, it, it's, I, I'll give them the credit of doubt. Maybe some congressmen don't get it, but I think a lot of them do. This is basically nothing but corporate crony capitalism. What we really need to do, what it really says, is we need to reduce those benefits. We need to make it not so darn easy for people to sit around and do nothing. We have to give them incentive to work. And in my mind, that's cutting back welfare substantially because welfare in all its various uh, components is now takes up two-thirds of our federal spending. It's just absurd. So don't let anybody tell you the refugees will work for rices that we, that Americans won't. We're paying the same amount. And what's more, you get trouble. So for example, the refugees in Colorado who saved this meat packing plant, Somalis, uh, a conservative congressman I know was talking it up, how wonderful it was they saved it, the, 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 the plant didn't close, everything was fine. And then the Somalis walked off because they couldn't pray when they wanted to. So, you know, you take what, you, what's, what's the phrase? It, 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 you get what you pay for. Exactly. Oh, so there's another chart, foreign born below the poverty level in uh, Minnesota. That's just another visual. But there's innumerable refugee problems that transcend just the welfare issues. They bring in diseases, exotic diseases. Uh, Lewis and Maine, the English as a second language budget, went up 4,000 percent between two, the year 2000 and now. I counted that. I did the math on that. 4,000 percent. 25 percent of the student body is not speak English. They speak 40 different languages. In Manchester, Manchester, New Hampshire, 82 different languages in high school. Manchester has one of the lowest ratings of any public school in the state of New Hampshire. Why? Because people that speak 82 different languages can't um, pass performance tests, which are all in English. It's not because the teachers are bad. Amarillo, Texas, 911 calls in 36 languages. How do you deal with that? How does anybody deal with that? And they're paying thirteen hundred dollars a student per one per month to tutor in English. It's just absurd. But see, we are being ripped off. We are being misled, and we are not being told about this stuff. And that—it's a conspiracy of silence. Well, that's just more stuff. Oh, here's another one. Somalis demanding free halal food. The regular food they get from the food stamps isn't good enough. We've been doing a lot to try to fight back. We need to do more. And just real quick, welcoming America is what the president created to uh, put us in our place. We are supposed to accept mass immigration they're using a, a method called culture shaping. And the founder of Welcoming America says we must recognize the role everyone must play in furthering the integration of recent immigrants. In other words, you and I have to put up with it. We have to accept this. We don't have a choice. We have to do this. Otherwise, we're racist. We're blah, 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 blah. And they use groups like the Southern Poverty Law Center to research us, write about us, and smear us. That's already happened to me. And here we go back to the history. Remember I said it's all tactics? We call us haters. We're the most generous, open, understanding, loving, compassionate people in the world. Whenever there's a problem in the world, who shows up first? In fact, most of the time, who's the only ones who show up? In Pakistan, they had that horrible earthquake. Who showed up? We did. And when they had the tsunami in uh, Indonesia, who showed up? U.S. Navy. 
We do. We are generous. But here was the goal. And it comes directly from Lenin. We can and must write in a language which sows among the masses hate, revulsion, and scorn towards those who disagree with us. That's where it came from. People think of Saul Alinsky and his rules for radicals. Saul Alinsky was just systematizing what Lenin wrote uh, a century earlier. And actually there was another guy named Herbert Marcuse who systematized a little bit before, uh, before uh, uh, Saul Alinsky came along. So I just wanted you to see real quick, and then we're done. I know, I'm going way over. I'm sorry. This is Welcome Economies, we, Global Network, convening. They call it a convening. It's not a conference, it's a convening. In Dayton, Ohio, this year or last year, there's David Louvel. He is the founder of Welcoming America. He's like 28 years old. He's, uh, you know, lionized and treated like a hero by the uh, White House. <laughs> 300 stakeholders in attendance. Do any of those stakeholders look unhappy about having all their money spent on refugees that suck up welfare resources? No, because those stakeholders are people with a stake in the game. Keynote speaker, Felicia Escobar from the White House. Oh, some entertainment. Everybody's having a good time, except the people who are paying for it. Now here's a nice collaboration, cross-ethnic collaboration panel. And that's Eva Hassett, he's the International Institute, and Ba Zan Lin from the Burmese Community Support Center. The reason I put that up there is because the Burmese Community Support Center will not come up on any VOLAG contractor or subcontractor list, but I guarantee you they are accepting uh, refugee um, grant dollars. That's how they run. A lot of, a lot of uh, uh, refugees who are employed are employed in these uh, government-funded community organizations that design specifically to service some aspect of the refugee community. Uh, their foundation support also, Soros, Tides, for all the, all the radical foundations. Okay, and here's another Crass commercial message by my book. <laughs> Thank you all very much for. Yeah.